It was good to see the sunshine as I drove in this morning, but it wasn't too nice looking at the thermometer. <laughs> Isn't it a joy to come here and have an opportunity to worship God? To sing praises? To draw closer? To tell him how much that we love him? And to recognize a little bit of how much he loves us. Let's take a, a few seconds here to sign, set aside some of the things that are pushing on us, some of the things that we think are pretty important. But probably in the long range don't amount to too much. Let's just take a little bit and think about how much God loves us and how close that he is to us. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, that we can know beyond any doubt that you're with us here this morning. Help us, Father, to feel your presence. Help us, Father, to open our ears, open our hearts, to hear you this morning as you speak to us, whether it's through music, whether it's through our speaker, whether it's you speaking directly to us. And Father, as the song says, that open our eyes that we may see visions of truth, truth, truth that you have for me. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we have to come here and worship you, sing praises to you, draw strength from you, draw wisdom from you. Help us, Father, to hear and to see as we worship you this morning. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand together, please, as we worship the Lord together.
children may be dismissed to Children's Church. And we would invite Mark to come and bring us the message. Rick had told me if uh, the podium doesn't get set up there, he says, can you handle it? And I said, well, if Cindy or him or somebody come get the other end of it, I could probably, <laughs> probably handle it. So, uh, You know, we're so glad to be back here again and uh, spend Sunday with you guys. Um, I mean, the comment, you just walk in and everybody's so genuine and, and authentic and there's no pretense. It's just like walking in with family and uh, pretty soon everybody settles down and it's time to start, time to start, you know. And uh, really pleased to think about what uh, God might be putting together here as far as our, our future relationship might be. So I'm in contact with, uh, of course, family and friends and saying these are some things that might be in the works. And, and they'll say, now where's Kettle Falls? And they'll get their <laughs> phone out and they'll look. And they'll, they'll even, now what's the name of the church? Community Bible Fellowship. Oh, okay. You know, and the variations on the name, though. Is it Community Church? No, Community Bible Fellowship. Fellowship Bible Church? No, no, it's Community Bible Fellowship. Read my lips, you know. So. But uh, got to examining the name Community Bible Fellowship and what all it means. And, and I like all three of those terms. Where I'd pastored previously in Butte, Montana, it was affiliated with the Evangelical Free Church. And so we were the Butte Evangelical Free Church. And that's quite a mouthful. But I liked each of those words. And I would learn what each of them mean and what meaning they had for us. But because that's so many syllables, we always changed evangelical free to just e-free. You know, or maybe you've heard ev free sometimes. And so I would answer, one time I answered the phone, beauty free. <laughs> that's what they said was, beauty what? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's not the way to handle this. So, in fact, we shortened it even more. Uh, we just called it be free. Now, I'd written the initials B-E-F-C thousands of times, and one time, just not thinking, I wrote out B-E, and I wrote out the word free. And then I wrote the C, which made be freak which wasn't going to work. <laughs> but we liked, we adopted the name be free because that actually said quite a bit about uh, um, who we were and what we wanted to do was, was show people freedom in Christ. And so as you examine a church's name, you kind of learn a lot about it. And I kind of want to look at... Uh, our name here today. As I look at the name Community Bible Fellowship, I like the word community because community uh, signals to me that you want to be an open, welcoming church. Some churches develop because they fear the world. They're afraid of what's out there. And the world can be a rough place. It is a rough place. And so if you build your fellowship around, in your congregation around um, kind of building a wall, a fort and a fortress, uh, that's easy to fall into. But the opposite of that is to welcome your community. And even though we want to be not worldly in here, we do want to be what? Welcoming to the community. So the word community is important because it shows that we are interested in showing people beyond our walls the truth of Jesus Christ. The word Bible is important because that's center. Everything here is based upon the Word of God. And if it's in God's word, that's going to be our, our walk of faith. And that's where we're going to find meaning. So I like community. I like Bible. Fellowship is a little bit different, especially it's not community Bible fellowship church. Nothing wrong with the word church. And we are a church. But calling yourselves a fellowship kind of takes it to a different level, I think. So church, uh, many of you know this, the word in the Bible, for church is ekklesia, that's the Greek word. And the word for church is, um, it means a group. That's, that's it. A group that does stuff together. Now, here's the kind of group I want to picture. I want to picture those soldiers that are marching in order, you know. We see those Marines marching, everybody's, the stripe on their leg, just, boy, they look good, don't they? And when they turn and salute, they do it together, and they fire the guns together. But that isn't how we are, really. 
We might want to be like that sometimes, but how are we? Oh, we all show up different. And we're more like that group of junior high boys that kind of goes down the street together and they're bopping each other and punching each other in the arm. And they kind of go across the street in a mob, you know. And I think that's kind of what we are really as a church. We're in the mob. In fact, it says wherever two or three people get together in his name, they can exercise authority as a church. Anytime Christians get together. Now, if you were to sit down with some church planters and they were going to say what a church was, they would say, well, a church uh, meets and they have to follow the Bible, yeah, and they got to have two ordinances and have elders. And, well, yeah, that's a healthy church. But the fact is, even when two Christians get together and have a fist fight, they're the church. They're not a healthy church. Anytime two Christians get together, you're being church. Church isn't what we sit through at 10 o'clock. Church isn't the building, although we, you and I know when we say, let's meet at the church, what we mean. So that's not really wrong, but the church is the people. And so why choose the word fellowship over the word church? Fellowship's important. That's kind of a different word. And that word is koinonia. Now, you're probably familiar with that word as well. Koinonia means it a little bit different. In fact, as I look at the word koinonia, it means working together. When you fellowship, you do, it's two people doing something helpful together. It literally means hands shared, shared hands. So you've all pushed a vehicle, and you're like, oh, I can't do this, and somebody jumps out and helps you. Oh, that's great. Five people help you? Ah! Oh. And if you get the, the sweet spot... Jump in and steer. Yeah, you guys push me, right? That's it. Fellowship is shared hands. And so as I began to think about community, Bible, fellowship, I was looking up words for fellowship, and I came across a neat passage in 1 John. So we're going to talk about the fellowship of the gospel today. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John, the very beginning of 1 John, chapter 1. And I want to read the first four verses as we go on here. 1 John 1, 1 through 4. I'm reading from the New King James because that's the translation I have and am familiar with. Uh, if you have something a little bit different, that's okay. The words are right here on the screen as well. The scriptures say, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. And there's a pause. He's talking about Jesus Christ here. He's talking about Jesus as he was when he walked on the earth. A cult had formed in John's day called the Gnostics, and they said Jesus really didn't appear in the flesh. Jesus really didn't have a body he appeared to, and John's coming out real strong against that. So he uses these verbs. That which our eyes saw and we handled and we touched and we could smell him and we could laugh with him and eat together. and Everything you could do with another person, that's the word of life. And he goes on and describes this. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. One thing you probably wouldn't be expecting to see if you were one of the original recipients of this is that word fellowship. Fellowship is that closeness. And he says you can have fellowship with God. That is not the God most of the people knew in that day, and it's especially not your Jewish audience would not think of fellowship with God. You didn't share hands with God in any way. Concerning the word of life, he's talking about Jesus here. The difference is going to be from the God they thought they knew to the God they really can know, the difference of fellowship is Jesus. Now, John had a relationship with Jesus. It's thought that perhaps John and Jesus were related. I'm 
I'm not sure I need that doctrine to be true, but it explains a few things for me. For instance, when Mary was serving at the wedding in chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, that means she's related to probably the person getting married, and it's thought that was maybe James or John's wedding. They're one of the sons of Zebedee. And so perhaps he even knew Jesus as a young boy living in towns not too far from each other, Nazareth and Cana, Capernaum area on the Sea of Galilee. But beyond that, he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. For three and a half years, they spent almost 24-7 together. They'd eat together, and they sat by a campfire together, and they fished together, and they laughed together. He says, in every way that I could be near Jesus, that which I've touched, that which I've heard, that which I spent time with, I, was, I knew that Jesus on that level. In fact, he had a special name, John did. Remember this? He was called the Beloved Disciple. Now, perhaps in a way that he didn't want to put himself out there and was exercising humility, but he felt loved by God. He felt loved by Jesus. And in fact, I think, not that Jesus loved him better than anybody else, so John was better, or the other disciples were second class. None of that's ever communicated. But what we do have is the fact that Jesus had a closeness with John that he didn't have with anybody else. You might say that if Jesus had a best friend, it was John. I don't know. I'm speculating here. But there was a special relationship there. He says, I knew Jesus on this level. In fact, he knew Jesus as an apostle. That means even after Jesus ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit still communicated to him. And he says, all this means what? Eternal life. And that's good news. Good news. Eternal life. Do we get too familiar with those words? eternal life? Do we get too familiar with the idea of our sins being forgiven? The good news that sin can be overcome? You know, if you were to go to somebody and tell them you need to be saved, and they go, from what? Sin. Well, I've made some mistakes, but I don't think I'm a sinner. I'm a good person. I'm better than most. Don't we give ourselves a pretty good grade in our sin life? I'm honest with you, I do. <laughs> And so that's what comes about when we have this good news. Well, this good news has to be declared. He says, when you're a fellowship, a koinonia, I've got a job for you to do, and we're going to do our hands together. We're going to share hands together on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're a fellowship, it's going to be a fellowship of the gospel, a fellowship of the good news. In fact, you could say this, the gospel of life is initiated by the Father. It is effected by the Son, and it's maintained by the Holy Spirit. That's not up in your notes there. You just have to listen carefully or go back to YouTube and hear it again. God the Father is the one that had the plan and initiated it and declared it and sent the messengers Jesus is the one that came to earth and put it all, through his obedience to the Father, put it all into effect. He died. He rose again. And the Holy Spirit's the one that works with us to maintain that good news. Well, if it's good news, that means there's bad news. So, if we're going to have this result of joy, we need to understand exactly why we're overcoming bad news, right? Right? To hear the bad news, it's couched in Romans chapter 3, and uh, there's a verse in there that declares our sinfulness, and it talks about the good news before it and after it. So to understand this, let's go to the book of Romans chapter 3. And I want to read verses 21 to 26. The Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is teaching about our sinfulness. Now, this is probably basic doctrine to a lot of us, but I think we do get kind of familiar with the, maybe too close, too familiar with the idea of our sinfulness and the good news of the gospel, and it's good to, be, to revisit this. 
So Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Remember that we're going to get deeper into this, but the righteousness of God is declared through the law. Okay? Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So we believe in Jesus Christ, and we receive the righteousness of God. Think about the words law, and think about righteousness of God, because we're going to be seeing those a little bit deeper here. Here's the bad news. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. We're back to good news here. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation. I went too far, didn't I? How do I go back? There we are. Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate the righteousness, his righteousness because of his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So let's look at this good news versus bad news. The bad news is God's righteous and I'm not. God's not just doing it all right, and I sometimes make mistakes. There's a vast difference between the righteousness of God and what I think my righteousness is, okay? When I find out that God is righteous and that separates me from him, that's not just inconvenient. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we say all, that's everybody. There are some out there that teach that people are born without sin, but we're all going to stumble in sin. Uh, no, the scriptures say not only are we all born in sin, we are all inheriting that from Adam and Eve, but we all commit sin. So we're born in trouble, and before we're old enough to know any better, just like a little kid might pick up a deadly snake, we sin, and then we're mortally wounded spiritually as well. It's not just trivial either. Sin is utterly sinful. I don't think we can appreciate how much it grieves God when we sin. However, the good news is we can be justified freely by his grace. Justification is a doctrine that says you can be changed and it can be as if you are not sinned. And if you have not sinned, then you will not be punished for your sin. We come across that word propitiation. And so if you're going, what's a propitiation? It's, it's a Bible word. It's not one we use all the time, right? Right? We don't talk about that when we bump into each other in Walmart. Hey, how's your propitiation going? <laughs> good, good, yeah, yeah. Got a little wrinkled last week. We don't, we don't even know what it is. In fact, some of your Bibles probably don't, they don't use the word. I, I like this translation here that says this. Yours will say uh, sacrifice of atonement, perhaps. And that's not inaccurate, but it doesn't convey everything that's there. A propitiation is kind of like a receipt. It's a paid in full. So when you ask the question, who did Jesus die for? He actually died for the Father. He died so that the Father would be satisfied, his wrath would be satisfied. All of it was placed on Jesus and not on us. And so when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, that's the signature on the receipt, so to speak. That's the propitiation. Yes, it was the sacrifice for atonement, but it was the fact that God... 100% dealt with sin. You and I can't do anything to deal with sin. Jesus didn't say, it is almost finished. As soon as Mark does his part, he's got it. No, it is finished. Those words mean something. That's propitiation that caused him to pass over sin. Once again, what your Bible's going to say, it's probably going to say something like, left sin unpunished. Yes, in English, though, it doesn't translate very well because what it should mean is it left 
the sinner unpunished, but the sin itself was enforced. Jesus was punished for our sin. So I can't really say it was unpunished. The sin isn't hanging out there like, oh, God just kind of winks at it. Yeah, I didn't really mean that rule. We'll let it slide this time. He can't let anything slide. As a holy God, he has to punish sin. So he punished Jesus, and he passed over it. And Now, what do you think of the Passover, right? I do. Israel's in Egypt, and they're getting ready to leave, and God is punishing Egypt. And he would have punished even his own people, but they did what? They sacrificed. And they took the blood, and they put it over the door. And when the death angel came through, sees the blood on the door, ah, the lamb was punished. Sin is dealt with. I'll pass over that sin. And so, if your Bible says something different than propitiation, something different than Passover, passed over, they're not wrong, okay? But know the full extent of what that means. In fact, the word for propitiation is actually a mercy seat. It is where uh, when the priest went into the Holy of Holies and would take the blood in, the blood was set on the mercy seat, and when God would look down and see the sacrifice, he would forgive the sins of Israel, actually putting them forward at that point because it was not the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, but the sin was dealt with. Sin has been passed over. And why does it have to be such? Well, if you go to the very end of chapter 6, just a page or two ahead, the last verse, and many of you have memorized this, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everything about sin is death and depravity and corruption on every level. Unless Jesus is involved, there's death and corruption on every level. Now, we all know good people, perhaps that aren't followers of God. We've all been involved with great projects that do some good, it appears, and yet nothing is without death and corruption, no matter how good it appears. Even a little bit of sin causes trouble. Uh, if I can be a little graphic here, I've, I've told this demonstration before. Uh, if we came in today and they'd made a pot of coffee and uh, said, where'd you get the water? They said, oh, you know, the toilet bowl was full of water and it was just sitting there. It looked pretty good. <laughs> I used toilet water. Nobody's going to drink that coffee. The next week, we provide water. And I get here and I, I guess, no, Rick, do you make the coffee? We say, okay, he wouldn't do this. But what if he said, uh, oh, I used up that water and there wasn't quite enough. I only used two tablespoons of toilet water today. It wasn't very much. We still wouldn't drink it, would we? No. Sometimes our sin isn't very much. It just has a little bit of sin in there. A little bit's devastating, and it can be awful. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's significant. Now we've moved beyond death, not just to, I'm not going to kill you, I'm not going to say, but eternal life, and the benefits are amazing. What happened? How do we get to know that God? Well, it wasn't always so. And what was the difference between the sacrifice? Why couldn't we just keep sacrificing animals? Why did Jesus have to die? We need to go clear back to the book of Exodus to find out. So Exodus 19, the chapter right before the Ten Commandments. Let's see what God's doing with the people of Israel. Nineteen verses seven through nine. Now we read that John said this gospel is declared. It's a declared gospel. That's been God's way to deal with with uh, His word. He could have invented any way to communicate Himself to us. He could have TV invented in the Garden of Eden. He could have. Uh, he has appeared in dreams. He could just speak to us in a, all in our own still small voice. But primarily God's way of speaking is to declare. He would make himself manifest. He would show up and communicate to his prophets, his apostles, and they would declare his word. So we're going to see God prepare the people of Israel to have their word declared, his word declared. So picking up at verse 7. So Moses came and called for the elders of the people. 
and laid before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak. They speak when I speak with you, and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. So Moses is the go-between, and God's initiating a covenant here. A covenant is merely a contract. If you've bought a car, bought property, you know about covenants. You know there are agreements that are made, and everybody decides who's going to do what. One of the things God stipulates in his covenant is there needs to be a distance between me and the people. If I read further down, he says, I need you to be clean, physically clean. Take a bath, wash your clothes. There needs to be something you do to yourself. I don't want any impurity there. I need you, in fact, to uh, be ceremonially clean. Husbands and wives, you need to be staying apart for a while. And, and distance. There needs to actually be a physical distance. Don't anybody go near the mountain. If anybody goes near the mountain, if even an animal goes near the mountain, it's got to be killed. So God says, when I come down on the mountain and I talk to the people, there's a distance. This is not fellowship. There's no sense of fellowship here. God has not initiated fellowship yet in this covenant because there is no Jesus Christ present yet. This is just a lamb. Look ahead to verse 16. Let's read from there real quick. It says, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings. When I typed that in, my spell checker didn't recognize thunders and lightnings as plurals. But that's what the Bible says. So thunders was ongoing thunders. And I get lightning going from all over the place is what I picture. And a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud. So that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now the sound of the trumpet very loud. Uh, You ever been near a loud trumpet? Maybe the pet band's playing in the gym and the real zealous trumpet student is right there. You ever been real near a police siren or an air raid siren and nobody will shut it off? Or or even the idiot that's got the air horn at the parade, right? I'm not a loud trumpet kind of guy. I like a mellow Herb Alpert. That's nice, but the loud trumpet and it's going and it's building and it's building. Okay, the next verse. 17, and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon the mount, on Mount Sinai and the top of the mountain. And the Lord called to Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So here's God initiating this covenant. And the trumpet's loud, and there's a lot of drama going on. It is an awesome display of God's presence. Picture yourself there. If we were to have a a call today at the end of the service and we said, if you need to meet with God in private, come on up. And we might even say something like this. The elders will be up here to pray for you if you need prayer. Have you ever been in a service like that? I have. It can be a very sweet time. Or we might say, we're going to dim the lights and have music playing. And you just meet God. In fact, that's one of the great things I like as a fellowship. You do. You say all this stuff. You start meeting God when you meet God's people here. But then what do you do? Stop. Get quiet. In fact, I think what uh, Daryl said today was, he didn't say, put those out of your mind, not yet. It's almost like, bring them to mind. Now you know what's distracting you from God. Now, have God put them aside. So it's even okay to bring those things to mind that are distracting you and say, God, I'm going to give that to you. For the next hour or so, I'm going to give that to you. I love that time of quiet that this fellowship takes to say, you know what? I'm going to set that aside. That's how we meet God. That's not how Israel meets God. 
God shows up and it's loud and it's shaking and there's smoke and there's lightning and thunders, okay? And what's the result? They're terrified as we would be. Reminds me of the line in the movie Forrest Gump when they're on the fishing boat, Lieutenant Dan's there and he says, hey Forrest, where's this God of yours, you know? Forrest says, funny, Lieutenant Dan should say that because right then God showed up. And here comes a hurricane. We understand God's power in those kind of things. When God brought forth a tsunami out of Indonesia several years ago, if you ever saw the, the global map of that, there was an earthquake out in the Indian Ocean and just the wave action as it circled the globe almost as if God took his finger and just touched the globe and devastating tsunami went across every ocean, pole to pole, eventually. I can remember receiving a call when I used to be an EMT in the Wind River Canyon in, in Wyoming and a train was hit by an avalanche and it didn't seem to be that much rock but it came down and it bent a flat car like a horseshoe. And I thought, the power of that coming, that's nothing. That's God touching a mountainside. When God shows up on the top of this mountain, people are terrified, and here's their reaction. Look over in chapter 20. Now God's given, Moses went up and he got the Ten Commandments, and he comes down and he's explained it to them. Verse 18 of chapter 20. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. That didn't sound like fellowship at all. There's no joy there at all. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood far off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Look again up there at verse 20. Moses says, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that his fear may be upon you. In other words, say, fear not, but fear. Once again, our English Bibles don't translate quite as well. Oh, don't be afraid of what you think God is. You don't have to be afraid of God in that way. That's the bad news you're afraid of. There is good news. Sin is dealt with. But there's no fellowship here. Fear not. God's dealt with your sin. So the people of that day and age could know forgiveness of sin. They could know that they could have a relationship with God. His righteousness would not destroy them, but it was not the same kind of relationship that we can have. They needed to also fear and understand the seriousness of this relationship they would have with God. Taken flippantly, it could be deadly. Taken flippantly and lightly, it was wrong. So fear not. Don't be afraid of your sin, but you better be afraid of the God that is, for he is so much higher than us. So how is that different for us? When the result is terror, and Moses goes up into the thick darkness, it says, how is it different for us? How can we promise fellowship? Let's go back to 1 John. I want to go to the verses we where we stopped, because this is amazing. We stopped at verse 4. Verse 5 says this, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Well, didn't Moses go up in the darkness? Yeah. It's not the darkness because of God. Darkness is because our unrighteousness does not allow us to fellowship with God unless Jesus Christ is involved. If we're going to be the Community Bible Fellowship, 
That last word, fellowship, literally anchors us to Jesus Christ. That's important. Going on from there, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we're going to be a fellowship, and yet we act flippant about sin and take God's offer of fellowship lightly, then we're in darkness. And we're lying about being a fellowship. Now we have fellowship with God. Look at this. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with God. We have fellowship with one another. Why does it click here? Why do we come in and everybody, you just hear the noise level. Everybody comes in and, and if you just stop and listen, you hear laughing and you hear joking. And you may see somebody having a rough time. They may have tears. But when they do, what do they receive? Comfort. So let me just tell you, I've been here two Sundays now. And I'm not trying to give you, maybe keep puffed up, but you're doing it right, okay? You love one another. You're a good fellowship. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, sin has been dealt with through Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean we're sinless. In fact, it goes on from there. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Many of you have maybe memorized that verse 9. It's a precious promise. God's light has overcome the darkness. We have to take the step and understand that we're born people of darkness. And we have dark souls. It starts off when the kids are little and they don't have to be taught to sin. The great thing of being a grandparent is you don't have to be the bad guy. You know, I said, I'm, I'm going to give my grandkids chocolate for breakfast and they can stay up till midnight if they want. And, and yet my first granddaughter, when she was born, uh, tell her, you know, we better do this. And she put her little chin out there once and says, no, Baba. <laughs> Baba, that's my, my name to the kids. And, uh, oh, your sin nature is showing you, Laura, you know. What a, is a, see the sweetest little girl in the world act like a sinner. And we've all been around kids, and we realize they don't have to be taught to sin. God has overcome the darkness, therefore we no longer have to walk in darkness. And if we have fellowship with God, we have fellowship with one another. In fact, we cannot really have a fellowship unless we first have fellowship with God. The difference between what Israel went through, the terror, instead of the joy, and the fellowship that we have is Jesus Christ came as a permanent sacrifice. The blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us, not just covered the sins that happened in the Old Testament. That's like sort of credit card debt, right? What do they do with Israel's sin? We put it on the card. That's, all of us have done that. Got a wedding coming up? Put it on the card. Got a vacation coming up? Visa that thing, okay? Sin debt? Yeah, put it on God's card because Jesus is coming. And someday he's going to hang on that cross and say it is finished. And now sin is dealt with. And now we can have fellowship with God. And we have cleansing from sin. Because what happens if I sin? Let me give you 1 John 1, 9, a little bit different. We say, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Very precious promise. And often as I walk in that, I go, oh, I slipped up. I've made God mad. And now there's something between us. I don't have fellowship with him. And uh, I, I got to confess it. That's a good thing. But that's not quite the meaning of that verse. We can say it like this. Since... We've confessed our sins, and he's been faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Therefore, he's cleansed us from all unrighteousness, even the stuff to come. The fellowship doesn't break. He's grieved, and we have something to work on. But God doesn't deal in guilt and shame. He deals in conviction. The Holy Spirit comes. He convicts his children. 
So if the enemy's lying to you, giving you shame, shame says you're a sinner and you're always going to be a sinner. Pathological liar, that's all you'll ever be. Struggle with porn, that's all you're going to be is a lustful addict. Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Holy Spirit says, I love you. We need to have fellowship. Let's deal with this. We take that sin and we're honest with God and he cleanses us from sin. And rather than terror, we have God's presence. We have joy. That's important. We have hands together with God. And God now uses us to do his will. Are we ready to take that as serious as Israel was? Same God. What an important task we have as a community Bible fellowship. If we're going to claim that name, that means us and Jesus got a job to do together. And it changes everything about your reality. How's your past? My past is forgiven. I was going to hell, but when I met Jesus, he forgave my past, and I'm not enslaved by that sin anymore. Not only is my past forgiven, but my present makes sense. That's really good. I have purpose now. I'm not just trying to find meaning and trying not to be bored before I I leave this earth. God's given us a task, and he wants us to join together. My past is forgiven. My present makes sense, and I have purpose And my future is secure. I don't have to worry. We're promised eternal life. Isn't it great to follow God? Isn't it great to be a fellowship? How can we take and make light of that that word fellowship? We kind of, it's another Bible word. We don't use it all the time. If we say you're coming over for fellowship, we're like, oh, it's a church thing, I guess, right? In fact, what do we say? There's going to be food, fun, and fellowship. Okay. I'm not sure what that means, but I mean, and that's okay, right? It's better than getting yelled at. But what does fellowship mean? I think it's just the church gets together and we get to have food and fun. Maybe they'll be singing and someone's got to open in prayer and close in prayer. No. God's called us to do his work. What a blessing that is. Let's pray. Lord, as we examine again what you've called us to do, who you've called us to be, we're so thankful that you've called us to be a fellowship. And Lord, as much as we can, we take that seriously. I thank you that years ago, you placed in the hearts of of men to make that concept important. And within the community of Kendall Falls, based upon the Bible, the word of life, may we be a fellowship. And through your hands, do your will, that there might be joy, that people might find eternal life. Thank you, Lord, and bless the rest of our time together, our fellowship together. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.